good. And thank you, Karen, for jumping in with that uh, recording now. And I'll remember to try to turn it off at the end as well. So two things um, just to start off today. Um, one, on Monday, my dog died. And so I'm a little bit out of sorts. But we're not going to talk about that right now because I'm holding it together right now. But the second thing is, I don't know a lot about plain language. Um, so this is a new thing, a new term, a new um, concept, I guess, for me. I was a technical writer in my uh, first undergraduate degree. Um, so I guess I thought of technical writing as trying to simplify and clarify and not use language that's um, confusing. Um, so I also thought of it as that. And I think that there are probably some parallels and overlaps. Um, but there are also a few, I guess, more common sense things about uh, the principles for plain language that I've uh, that I've run into um, in the last week of, of thinking about this and, and researching it. Um, and those are on the activity sheet, which I am sharing in the chat. Again, I encourage you to jump into uh, that activity sheet and um, put your thoughts or questions that you think we should uh, discuss today, and we will um, we'll do that. We'll we'll be sure to address them. And so here's a here's a pick here's the activity sheet that we can look at. Let's see if I can make it a little bit. Oops, didn't mean to do that. A little bit longer for you. That's what I wanted to do. All right. Um, so syllabi design is is really sort of an interesting um, and confusing topic. Um, and it seems so simple, right? If I think back to the, the syllabi that I had as an undergraduate, they were printed off, right? We got them handed out to us in this sort of paper format. Um, many pages sometimes, some of them were very simple and, and they were um, given other papers, you know, throughout the semester um, as, as needed. But often, you know, sometimes they were like super thick documents that we didn't really want to read. What we would do is we would look through them and we would say, oh, this is interesting, this is not interesting, but we would read them to sort of see what is the instructor like? Is this like a really legalistic instructor where we have to really pay attention to what the, the details are? Um, uh, what are the expectations of the course? Um, it was kind of a way to sort of game um, as students try to figure out what do I need to do in this class and how do I need to balance this class with all of these other classes that we do. Um, they're no longer paper, generally, right? Especially if we're teaching remotely, um, you'll get a document. And one of the fun things that you can do with the documents is you can add links. You can um, spread things out. You can do more uh, graphics because you don't have to run it through the mimeograph, right? Or the Xerox machine um, to um, show those graphics. So you can add some graphics, you can add some pictures, um, you can make them look really nice. Now, the thing about this is that according to the definitions of the syllabi, they are, let's see. Oh, did I take out the syllabus? No, there it is. Communicates information about a specific course and defines expectations and responsibilities. And if you think about that, that's that's everything that you do in your course, right? Throughout your entire course, you're communicating information about it and you're defining expectations and you're redefining and you're clarifying expectations over and over and over again throughout your course. So the, um, the temptation is that, oh, I'm gonna put all of this in the syllabus and then you end up with a document that's you know inches thick, many, many pages, and it has all kinds of stuff. It has uh, the boilerplate stuff that needs to be in the official campus syllabus, that durable record. And also we try to balance that sometimes. If, if we think about it, we try to balance it with sort of a, hey students, welcome to the course. This course is important um, and will help you uh, achieve your goals because of X, Y, and Z. And in some ways that's almost too much to ask for a document at the beginning of a semester when students are overwhelmed with all sorts of things coming at them. So I guess the, the, the 
the short overview part that I would say is think about a learner-centered syllabus and include all of those boilerplate things and include all of those um, the details for the assignments elsewhere linked out from that boilerplate um, assignment so that your students can look at your syllabus, your short, sweet, concise and clearly written in plain language syllabus and then um, look at it like a roadmap and say, all right, we're starting here and we're going to go to these places because of these reasons. Okay, that makes sense. It's the learning objectives, right? The outcomes that we have. And this is why we're going to do that. Feeds back to the learning outcome. This is why we're going to do that. Feeds back. And eventually uh, we'll get to this end point. Now along the way, if you think about your the beginning of any trip that you take, you look at the roadmap, but you don't think about, oh, in six hours and 14 minutes or 300 miles or whatever, we're going to have to take exit 417. Like if you look at that at the beginning of the trip, for all of the exits that you're going to have to take and all of the turns and whatever, that's too much. It's too overwhelming at the beginning of a trip to think about that. That's why we have signs. That's why we now have uh, Google Maps and, and in-car navigation, right, to tell you when you need it, when that information is more relevant, that's when you want to know you're going to take that exit in half a mile or in, you'll, you'll, see the, you'll see a little bit finer detail when it's important and relevant. And welcome to the people who just came in. I know that your chat looks empty, so I'm going to plug in um, a link to the activity sheet. And we're talking about the activity sheet right now. So that's kind of the, the way that I'm going to approach um, thinking about the syllabus. Um, exactly, just-in-time delivery. Thank you, Mike. Um, it's, if you give too much information at the beginning of the course, and you know this already, right? It makes sense to, to all of us. Um, we pay attention to specifics when we need the specifics. And if we don't need the specifics, then our eyes kind of gloss over and we try to scan past it, right? And it's in that scanning that we miss things that are important. So put the scanning, the stuff that you, you need in detail, make it easy to find so that they can see it and say, okay, I need this now, click on that link, and it goes out to a, a, a bigger, uh, more detailed space for it. Now I see in our audience, we've got fantastic resources um, for syllabi um, on campus, and I invite them to jump in and um, share other perspectives, share um, any suggestions on how to do this that I've missed out on the activity yeah. sheet here and, uh, and such. So I'm just going to give like 15, 20 seconds for folks to raise their hand or unmute and jump in if they'd like. So John, I wanted to yeah, just well, push back a little bit uh, against the just in time kind of stuff. Okay. Uh, because I am finding, you know, now that we're at the end of the semester, the students all needed a place to look back to, to oh. see all the stuff that they needed to know for when were assignments due, that kind of stuff. And so doing sort of a just in time, then they have to go and search 20 million different places to find it. And I have folks that are <laughs> doing a terrible job and I'm having to go through multiple times to answer the same questions again. Yeah, really, really good point. Um, and I think that I don't mean just in time as in, um, so using the Google Maps metaphor again, um, there's a way to see like every turn, turn by turn directions, right? And I sort of think that's the course schedule. That'd be a metaphor for the course schedule, um, where you can link out to it, see everything in the calendar, when it's due, all of that stuff you can do in Canvas. It, does, it works in Canvas in many ways uh, because it shows up on their Canvas uh, calendar. But yeah, you need to be able to see that as a student. But it's not, it's almost like too much to see at the very beginning um, in that learner-centered syllabus, in my opinion. Sandrine, what are your thoughts? Um, yeah, I've been thinking uh, this semester is the first time that I do that, but because of, um, you know, everyone being so distracted by, for so many reasons, I really thought when I was writing my syllabus, syllabus, I really want to be concise. So I thought about the questions, who, when, 
what and why. And that was really on, on a two page. And then the overview of the course had more information, but I just, for them to digest that at the beginning of the semester. And I felt that actually they retain more information that way than I usually see them do. So that's just, uh, yeah, it worked well to do it that way. Yeah, and, and there's, um, in this lower section here, one of the ideas that they have from, um, oh, who was that guy? Uh, he does visual graphics or visual communications um, in these uh, links up at the top here. He says, write, write, the quest, write the headings as questions. And it's, it's a sort of a wonderful idea for the student to say, all right, what will we learn in this class? How much time will it take, you know, or do I need to spend on this class? Um, what if I'm absent? All of those sorts of things. I like the idea of, of the who, what, where, and when um, as uh, it, it's a good way to think about a lot of what we do. And it helps us as instructors think about that too, so that we don't miss, it's kind of a checklist of questions. And I don't know, look at the, the um, chat window here. Um, Terry, do you wanna say more about the, the reference plan? Hang on, sorry, I'm, I'm unmuting myself and video unvideoing. <laughs> I'm trying to share my video. Do you mean, oh, the reference place? Well, I just thought it was really useful what you just said about maybe there's a place for a reference where the students can go back to that's always there, sort of a both end. So if I'm doing just in time work, then they can, that's good. I, I agree with you completely because uh, they'll get overwhelmed and lost and, and forget it, but then just knowing there's a place to go back to. Yeah, and it's part of, this is one of the wonderful things about having Canvas as a standard learning management system on campus is that the students are used to that format. They're mm -hmm. used to being able to see things as a course schedule and they're used to being able to sort of see everything under assignment. Uh, the arrangement that you have under modules or maybe you have a, a page that sort of puts this into more detail, but it's not all in like one document that you are forced to read that first week when you're reading right. all of this other stuff. I'm hoping that there are more people with pushback on this um, besides Will, um, because it's a, I think it's a, it's a slow evolution of the syllabus. And there's also the official campus syllabus, right? And I feel like these are almost two different things at this point. I feel like um, they will eventually turn into uh, merge, um, and I'm hoping that somebody can correct me if I'm misunderstanding this, but the um, the official syllabus is more of a, a legal document or a durable record, I think was the term that uh, uh, they use on, on, on the site here. Go ahead, Terry. Well, I, I agree with you that, that that from the perspective of provost, the, the it is a legal document, but I love what you just did though, is by saying that there's a, a difference between the course schedule and a course learning map, perhaps, and a course syllabus, which becomes a legal record of, of expectations for the students. And it is a bit more contractual um, on how, in other countries as well as more and more in the US. So maybe that's maybe it's a really nice distinction actually. If I'm thinking about what's the learning map for my students, what's the schedule of activities they have to be able to follow, and then what do I need to provide to the university um, just because the bean counters need the beans to count. Yep, exactly. And Christine Evans, I, I love the idea of, of, of uh, uh, capturing the categories, um, but not the details for, the, for those assignments. And Hazel, same thing. That's the, the micro, macro, um, what level do I want to look at this in? Um, and there's not, I think that links let you sort of zoom in, if you will, um, from that macro view. If I want to zoom in, I can click on the link. It's not a perfect zooming metaphor, but it's, 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 a right, it's that right idea. Um, this link that I highlight here, I thought was a, a, a really nice um, reference for that idea of having a learner-centered um, document to sort of introduce the course in addition to um, the official, or, or they, they called it a, a, a master syllabus. I, I suspect that that term is no longer being uh, used though as we are um, becoming more aware of a language. Um, okay, so let's see. We've got some questions here in the uh, that you'd like us to address on the uh, left-hand side, 
And as always, I encourage um, the many folks who have more experience at this than I do, um, or different experiences, to jump in with their thoughts and answers um, on the right-hand side. Um, and as they do, as you all do that, um, we can talk through the individual ones and, and discuss them. Um, but jump in, this is a crowdsourced, in many ways, uh, participant-driven um, document right now. It's editable for everybody. I think we've got the link still uh, being shared in the uh, chat there. So if you haven't gotten to that, um, please feel free to jump into that. And then I think let's start, go ahead and start off. All right, so uh, what should and shouldn't be in the syllabus? So again, let's recognize that maybe you'll have two documents, um, one sort of that official syllabus, and um, there is a link to that information. There's all kinds of great inf uh, information about syllabuses at UW-Madison. Um, and there's a link to using the APHIS tool that um, lets you set up that syllabus um, and add information to uh, sort of a boilerplate uh, template, if you will, um, that includes all of the required se sections and um, of, of, of what needs to be uh, those policies. Now, outside of the boilerplate policies, um, think of it as what would you need as a student uh, to figure out how to deal with um, and um, effectively navigate your course. You'd want to know a little bit about the instructor. Uh, you'd want to, you know, and see that instructor's personality in there, I think. Um, we've got a great list here going on here. Strategies and resources to answer their questions. Um, yeah, where do I go for help is a good one. Um, how to solve technical questions. I think that one of the nice things is um, in, this is the document that lets your students, that sets the culture for your course. So if you want the students to start looking at each other as resources as, and figure out some of their uh, questions on their own, start encouraging them to develop those strategies right away. This is in some ways probably the first thing they're going to read about your course, right? So this is a great spot to push those uh, Wisconsin experience ideas, right? We want them, if we want them to be uh, empathetic and, and have some humility in your course, model it there yourself and say, there will be some things that I don't necessarily know the answer, but I will try to, my best uh, to figure out what these are. Um, ask your students uh, how to solve those questions because I might not be able to know all, or give you all of the answers as quick as you need to. So set them up to interact with each other. Uh, relentless curiosity, um, purposeful action, um, in, this semester, in this class, I'm going to want you to bring your passions, your skills, your expertise into the class with you so that you feel like it's relevant to you and connected to your life. Um, intellectual confidence. I want you to step up and participate. Um, I love that somebody added the participation expectations. Um, this is where you say, I want you to stand up and be heard in this class um, in whatever format is most comfortable for you and push yourself a little bit beyond that um, if you can. So those are great um, opportunities. Oh, Mike Maddox, thank you so much for um, the upcoming professional development through UWHR. This is, I've signed up for that and they didn't have it before this um, course, or at least I didn't see it before that, but I'm going to, um, let's see, you put it in on the bottom. I'm gonna look for it. There it is, bottom of the activity sheet. Thank you very much. Everybody should go sign up for this because um, I think that you'll get some good information from that. All right, back up to the top. Let's see what else is there. Course outcomes of grading policy, uh, tone and language for inclusivity. Great, these are all good elements. Kelly, thank you for jumping in. I just saw your chat. Go ahead. Yeah, I was just. I was just going to ask the question I put in the chat before you skip past it. Um, Great, thank you. Yeah. 
Okay, so go ahead and ask that question. Um, yeah, so I was just wondering, because in the past, I think I've fallen into the trap of like trying to put everything in one document. So it's like communicated up front, but the reading list, as we all know, inevitably changes throughout the semester. Um, so I was just curious for the folks who said it should not be a reading list if the thought is that reading list is like posted somewhere else and if just like having the list of what they need to do each week in the canvas modules is sufficient for that i i would say yes um talking about an overview of some of the topics that we're going to talk about is good link them out to a, a a module in the canvas site or a page in the canvas site um, because as you say that might change and Especially, you know, if something happens in the in March, uh, where all of a sudden we're no longer meeting face to face, things might change. Um, who knows what can happen? Um, being able to build in as much flexibility as you can, um, let this lets you do that. Um, so yeah, uh, uh, Jen, excellent point. Uh, required textbooks, the sort of the requirements, that's sort of the participation of how much is this course going to cost me. Um, being upfront and, and, and open about that is, is, is great. Okay. Good. That list continues to keep on going. Very good. Thank you, Mary, for jumping in with that. Um, and when you do have some of those um, sort of policy statements that are cut and paste from a boilerplate, uh, one of the recommendations was to um, sort of separate them and, you know, Put them in a box or something and say the official language on this is da 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 da. Um, that way the students don't think that you speak in that official language. It communicates that you um, affirm that language, that you agree with that language, that you're going to be expecting these policies to be taken or followed, but it doesn't make you sound like the uh, the in, uh, the enforcer or the that these are all your ideas. There are a lot of things that um, that we need to do, and uh, you know they're not the our favorite parts of teaching necessarily, but they're parts that we have to do. And helping the students recognize that you're not the person that's making them do that. That these are just things that you and they both need to do together. That sort of helps um, people not develop sort of bad feelings towards each other, right? We're all in this. It's sort of like a we're all in this together um, language. And here's the box of uh, a constraint that we have to uh, work on together to get through together. OK, any other questions about that, uh, what to include or not include other than the policies? Yeah, there are some really great templates. Uh, thank you, Karen, for jumping in with that. You might have some templates that your department or school um, puts forth and encourages you to look at and to use. Start there. Start with those, um, those documents. Sometimes those documents are more of the official version of the, of the syllabus rather than the learner-centered version of the syllabus. Um, but Either way, your department wants them for a reason. Start start with that and, and work from there. Oh, Lindy, it would be great to have a working session of um, syllabi swapping. It would be great to have a working session where um, people share their uh, front pages of their Canvas courses um, and um, all of these other things. And oh, man, I wish I could organize that. Um, we can do a show and tell. Should we do a show and tell? Let's do a show and tell next uh, semester, um, either at an active teaching lab or at some other sort of thing. And we'll get a bunch of people in there. I like the idea. We'll call it a show and tell. Excellent. OK, somebody help me remember that, OK? Because I love this idea. We'll do show and tell of, of, of uh, favorite teaching things. <gasps> oh, and we could do it as part of the teaching and learning symposium, maybe. <gasps> Great idea, Karen. OK. Good, we're set for that. Next, <laughs> what syllabus content should be supplemented with recorded video? Can syllabus content be replaced with video? 
Well, that's an interesting question. I do not know. Um, yes, uh, there is definitely has to be a an, an official campus syllabus that is uh, that durable record, and that I believe has to be text based um, with those certain elements. Um, but uh, the idea of the recorded video, again, because we're in a learning management system rather than that printed off sheet uh, packet of papers that we give to students at the beginning of the semester, there's definitely a place for recorded video in welcoming your students to your class. This is way better than a text-based um, introduction to yourself, right? Because a video can capture some of the, the gestures and the, the non-verbals that we communicate in our faces and, and our voice inflections, like, I'm very excited to, to work with you this semester, and I expect you to do da 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 da, -da. That's way more clear than if we were to just type that out, right? Even if we did use italicized uh, words and um, boldface and things like that. So it's a yes and, I believe, to have your syllabus, both a an official syllabus and your learner-centered syllabus, but then also have a welcome video. Yeah, absolutely. Other thoughts on that from folks? I see some great stuff in the um, in the box here. Yeah, but I, I would invite you. I would tend to say you know both and, but there's also the problem for me if something is only in the video. Then I have to go back through and find that exact spot where if it's written, it's much easier to scan through and find that detail about, you know, what's supposed to happen on page 23 of this paper that I'm doing. I mean, not that I would put that in the syllabus, but it's, Good. it's, that, kind of, <laughs> it's that kind of stuff. And, and just captioning and transcripting, I think, is... Is, is still problematic because it doesn't have the headers and the questions and the organization to make it yep. quicker to access. And and I don't think that a, a video is the best place to sort of put what's in the syllabus, right? I think a video is a really good place to share your excitement for the topic, like tell the story of why you're passionate for the topic so that you can inspire your students to be there as well encourage the students to like bring their passions into that. Um, I don't see it as syllabus work as much other than the overlap of um, welcoming you to the course and sort of an introduction of some of the things that we're going to learn in your own voice with the, sort of the, the informal stories that you might tell in that. Um, again, not too long, don't do a recorded welcome to the course video that's an hour and a half. Of, of them listening to you. But in a three to five minute video, that'd be a great introduction to um, help the students figure out who is this person that I'm gonna be working with this semester? What are their expectations? Um, and is it gonna be any fun for me? Um, and yes, transcripts are, are great um, um, and necessary as well. I don't know of any transcript screen uh, screencast templates. Um, I suspect that somebody might have that. Uh, this is one, again, where a show and tell would be really good um, because people have figured that out. And I guess if you have a storyboard, I've never looked into that, but I bet there are storyboards out there for course intros uh, that people have put a lot of thought into. Um, I'm afraid I don't have the answer to that though. All right. Is there a case for a syllabus to appear as a Google slide deck rather, or a wiki rather than a text-driven document? All right, good. Somebody's jumped into that. Uh, less easy to navigate. I agree with that. It's much easier to scan through a single document than it is to click from slide to slide and be like, was that two slides back or three slides back and going back and forth. Um, I think a Google slide deck or a video might be a good way to sort of intro every topic or thematic element or concept of the course, but um, I'm not sure that it would be a good spot for sort of that. I think there is something still very useful about that um, single document. Um, and I think that what we can do now is, uh, I'm gonna expand this a little bit beyond text driven, right? and point you 
to one example of many. If you Google graphic syllabus, you will find so many examples of this. But here's one. It's got this kind of fun anime sort of graphic, uh, in case you didn't know. Um, the font's not very easy to read right now. I think that this is actually all graphic rather than text, so it's not scannable by a, a text reader, but I don't know. I just, I don't know what the actual document is. It might be scannable. Um, you can do pretty basic text layout in Google Docs, right? And that is uh, accessible and scannable if, if, you, uh, if, if you do it right. So avoid graphic text, for example. Um, this stuff I should be able to highlight and read and I can't. But this is great. Like, what are we going to read? What are we going to write? Uh, what's going to help my grade? How am I going to be graded? This is all sort of really basic stuff that, um, and, and it's put together in, in sort of a, a, a different way. Um, it's not a slide deck, it's not a video, but it is another um, non-text, uh, text-driven, I guess it's still text-driven, but it's, it's, it's a little bit um, a little bit more than that. I should have included a couple of my uh, examples that Morton Gernsbacher does a really good job of these graphic syllabi. Um, and I'm sure that there are other folks on campus who do, but she shares them with me. So um, every semester I get to see hers and she has that sort of, what do I need to do to, 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 um, to succeed? How long will it take? All of these uh, questions that are answered and uh, graphics and it's engaging and it's really a uh, nice. Okay, I'm gonna look at chat real quick to catch up. Um, I see Lindy, yeah, the challenge with both and is keeping everything updated. And that's why I think that um, they should be a little bit different. They should overlap a little bit um, thematically, but like put all of the dates in one place. Don't put dates across five different places because then yeah, next semester you're gonna have to change them all. But even if you change one thing this semester, you have to remember to change them all across all of those things. I have problem with that as well. Um, Karen, thank you for sharing the uh, template uh, syllabus quiz. Can you also put that comment, Karen, at the bottom of the activity sheet um, so that we can get it there as well outside of chat? Thank you. And then Mike, um, what do the students prefer in a syllabus? Well, that's a good question. Um, I don't know. I don't know what the I don't know what the students want. Um, has anyone heard of what uh, heard feedback from students about what makes a good syllabus for them or what doesn't make a good syllabus for them? Keep it short. Yep. Keep it concise. Um, I suspect that a lot of um, a lot of these are things that your students sort of want as well. Um, I love your idea, Terry, of let's ask them on, on, on the first day or ask them on the, the last day. Um, before you finish your semester this semester, say, hey, students, um, what was most useful about my syllabus? What was not most useful or what was least useful about my syllabus? I'm going to rechange, I'm going to change it for next semester. What would be helpful to the students next semester? Um, help out your students, help out your colleagues, your peers, um, by helping me make the syllabus better for them. Um, again, another spot where we know what we know, and maybe we know what we've heard in a show and tell from professional development, but we have not had as much experience as with a variety of instructors as your students do every semester, right? They're in four or five different classes, um, and if you know, if they're sophomores, juniors, seniors, uh, that's, that's a lot of instructors that they've seen. They've seen really good examples that work for them. They've seen really bad examples. Ask them, not just for the syllabus, but for everything that we do. So very good. Um, headings, headings is a really big part of this and it's in our, uh, our second thing. And sections, um, if you use sections um, that can visually separate them so that the students don't get into the sort of, and, and I don't know if you've been in this, but I've certainly read documents where I'm like, da -da 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 and then all of a sudden I'm like, wait a second, am I thinking of something else right now? What happened there? And I have to sort of go back because I didn't see the shift. I thought, 
one paragraph to the next paragraph, same topic. Make it more clear, use those headings. And most important stuff first, that's a really good one to add in there. Ooh, can you add that right there? Can you add that to, uh, to number nine? There, somebody add that, Jens. Most important stuff first, right here, number nine. Okay, I'm gonna move back up and any other thoughts on that before we move to the next comment or question? Again, thank you all for jumping in with uh, ideas and oh, the social presence is, is a really good um, uh, resource as well. Are there plans to modify the official university sections of the syllabus to incorporate these techniques or should can we make them an attempt to do this ourselves? I don't know the answer. Um, but yes, you can use it as a starting uh, starting point uh, to personalize it, etc. cetera. Um, And it, is give, it, gives, it gives you a, a template to, to start with as well. So, so that's great. Yeah, it's a, it's a great checklist um, of the things that need to be in there. So um, it's wonderful to have that so that it's not just a, I think I've got all the pieces, but maybe I don't. Uh, thank you, Mary, for jumping into that. All right, what would you call a collection of those linked out <laughs> elements on the syllabus? Is it a course orientation or a handbook? Oh, I like, I like that idea, course, course handbook. Um, and where's the best place to store that? I think it's kind of a distributed thing. Uh, and in some ways, maybe the, the, the syllabus is that table of contents, um, but it's a table of contents with context, right? So it's not just, a an index. It's not just a, a list of chapter one uh, course policy, uh, page 14. Um, it's, it's a paragraph that introduces, again, this is, as your instructor, this is why I feel that this is important. And the details of this are here. And, and maybe that's a link to, you know, all of my thoughts about this. As I was writing this, I was I was thinking about um, number four here, right? I've done this many times in in past syllabi, where I'm like, all right, I've taught this course long enough that I know that these are the parts where the students are going to stumble or they're going to go off the wrong path, and I will have a section in my syllabus that explains why I think they should, you know, do something in a certain way and not in another way. And I'll write a whole paragraph on that and it'll be very much in John's voice uh, and argument for that, but it's a long extra argument that does not need to be there. What I could do and what I should do and what I'm now doing is I've got a separate document for that. So I should have a, um, in the like, how do I study section, um, short little uh, heading or a, pair, uh, a bullet point with a link to there's my long ironclad argument about why you should do it this way and not this other way. Um, that's up outside of the, the syllabus itself. Um, I guess it's still technically part of that course handbook um, that we're talking about, but it's not part of the that, what do I want the students to read that first week? Um, because it's that first week when they're in their class trying to figure out about your course, um, they can't read everything. Um, it's just too overwhelming. Jen, exactly the need to know versus nice to know. The nice to know, link it out. Uh, the need to know, put it in there as concisely as you can. And um, this is, session is turning into more about uh, syllabus design than it is about plain language, but uh, just a reminder that We've got information about plain language at the top of this and below this as well. And honestly, um, plainlanguage.gov has, that's where I found most of this information on plain language. There wasn't a whole lot that I found on plain language in academia or plain language in syllabus design. So it's sort of a, how do I adapt um, what I find in the one spot to this uh, academic situation? 
other thoughts on on um, the oh let's see what do we have here course information module yeah yeah you call it a week zero module right that's that spot where it's sort of the the course info this is what you need to know to be successful in the class and come back and revisit this um, module throughout the semester it will always be available um, you've got yeah module zero thank you um, we'll give you in module one what you need to know for unit one that first set of concepts that we're going to talk about but and in unit two we'll have another module for that but for unit zero it's sort of a or unit oh it's overview right uh, module overview good all right and terry yeah you that that idea to introduce active learning a great way to sort of set the tone and expectations of the course um, and yet so many of us at least i expect so many of us on our first day of course either we have experienced this as students ourselves or we've done it as instructors and oftentimes both that first day is let's look at the syllabus and are there any questions and we read through and we say stuff and it's sort of a the students are listening right and in some ways we're setting up the culture that this course is going to be about me talking about the syllabus or unit one or unit 12 or whatever and you listening and smiling and nodding if that's what you want for your course okay but if you can instead set up that first day so that they actually start to participate um, an active learning activity by having a breakout or a discussion group related to the syllabus um, some people have had uh, syllabus scavenger hunts uh, what is it called syllabus quest right where you start having quizzes about what's in the syllabus um, and that you can either keep in that really short sweet document or you can expand out uh, to some of those uh, uh, side documents as well but yeah setting up the culture right away okay um use or not use the canvas syllabus menu i would invite whoever put that in there to sort of ask uh say more about that question um it was me who put that in there all right i you know so i've always ignored the build-in canvas syllabus because it seemed like a duplicate thing with, which had you know, maybe some advantages, but the the big disadvantage in my book is that, you know, it, it distributes the information in different places. And so why have a, your own syllabus if you're going to use that or have the Canvas syllabus if you're going to use your own? And I think that it's now called the course summary, right? I think they renamed it as the course summary. One of the things about the Canvas syllabus that I always um, hated in sort of the default canvas is that it was more of a course schedule, right? Um, it had dates and such on it. And there was maybe a little bit of room at the top for the policy information, but really not a lot. It, was, it felt like it was more of a, a, a course schedule. Um, I, I would tend to hide that, um, but you absolutely do need to link to the, um, the official syllabus for the course so make sure that that's um that that official syllabus is is easily accessible and easily findable um, for the course what are some other other people's thoughts of that i see not a fan anybody figure out a really good way to use it in a sort of a learner-centered way yeah kirsten please so I found it to be helpful, but in a very special circumstance that I hope to never find myself in again. Um, I, <laughs> <laughs> um, we had a course during during the pandemic. Um, so I, I teach in the medical school, and I my rotation, my course is typically a clinical course. Um, and when our students had to stop working in the hospital at the start of the pandemic, we had four separate course directors working together in a 
um, online course that we put together on a very short timeline. And so having that course schedule was super valuable because we had so many cooks in the kitchen, each um, trying to structure our assignments in a similar way and organize the Canvas site that we were using in a way that would make sense to the students. Uh, but we were essentially running one course on Monday, a different course on Tuesday, a different course on Wednesday, and so forth. And so having it all brought together in a course schedule, I think, was very useful for orienting our students and keeping them on track um, but you know I, I hope I never have to do that again and 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 for instructors too right was that yes yeah, yeah for multiple yeah. instructors and some yeah. of the course administrators were um, helping with different um, days um, and so having them see the the weekly overview and really it ended up being a 12-week course being able to see that big picture on the canvas syllabus was super helpful for organization um, but it wasn't it's not a syllabus yep yep very good and Jen thank you for sharing uh, the idea the solution to link the course syllabus document the official one um, and then in navigation under uh, settings navigation anything that is uh, above that line um, will show up for the students to see and just take that course summary idea and drag it down underneath that and then the students won't see it and it won't be a the, the problem with having all of those um, navigation elements in canvas visible is it can be very confusing and overwhelming for the students right if you, for example, show files, um, the students might be going through the files and the Canvas file system is not great, right? So unless your naming and uh, titling scheme for documents is really good and you've really put a lot of thought and effort into those course files, I found that it's much easier to just link to them in context of a page rather than have the students try to dig through and find, well, which one is the one for week 12? And is it maybe untitled document number 12? Um, I try to avoid that as much as possible. So yeah, keep that navigation menu as empty as you can. Again, recurring theme for all the stuff, keep it simple for your students. Um, if it's not simple, it could overwhelm them. All right, good question about what the AFIS syllabus is and a good answer. Um, and uh, more information about that is in the, uh, where did I put that there? I think it's on this link, course syllabi at UW-Madison, um, I believe is the one that links you to um, how to use the APHIS tool, what is it, what can it be, um, et cetera. Just a couple things to add, John, Thank about you. that. Um, I just wanted to say that the APHIS syllabus tool is going through some updates to help support some of the new campus language because we're kind of in, you know, strange COVID remote learning time. So I just want to say that the updates will be made very soon. So you can use it as a template to cut and paste. You can use it as the APHIS tool to import directly into your Canvas course. So there's multiple ways to use some of the policy specific language and to find it all in one place. Those updates should be made um, very soon. So hold tight, there'll be a campus message about that. But all the COVID-related policies, all the testing-related policies, quarantining, and then any exam policies that may shift as a result of what's happening on campus will be in that template. So it's a good resource, even if you're doing the syllabus without it. It's a good place to go to just kind of have like a checkoff system for checking to see if you have um, some of the guidelines that are unique to remote learning. Um, some of the um, Michelle, I'm not sure if you want to add anything, but there are some other new guidelines that might be coming out with language on accreditation for the credit hour policy and what is considered, um, oh, I can't even think of the word, like, uh, thank you. Regular, <laughs> regular and substantive student interaction. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, that's the, that's the mouthful I was losing. So there's some new language that will be coming out on that as well for accreditation. So for for uh, to, to clarify, um, we're talking about what used to be the uh, it's not Rockefeller Vanderbilt. Uh, who's the person? Carnegie. Uh, Carnegie. The seats <laughs> in number of hours in the seat. Um, that's shifting. Is that what I'm hearing? So it's more about substantive 
instructor. That, well, that, that shift actually happened quite a while ago, and people are certainly encouraged to refer to the campus credit hour policy. Uh, we are definitely not on Carnegie units um, anymore, but as we shift to more uh, uh, remote learning, um, the federal government has now provided us with a definition of a key phrase that they use in the federal definition of a credit hour, uh, which is regular and substantive student instructor interaction and what that mouthful means. And we'll be adding that to the syllabus template, as Mary Great. said. Very soon. Great. And in the learner centered syllabus that one creates, translate that for your students. Um, if you use that mouthful as a student, like what would you do if you ran across regular and substantive interaction in a, a course description or, 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 or a part of your syllabus? It, it's sort of a off-putting, like what does this mean even phrase? That's sort of the anti-plain uh, language, right? Um, it's more, uh, instead you could have things like, this is how we're going to be learning. This is what active learning is going to look like. Am I so right? yes, Don. So I think where um, Michelle, it, it's the policy, so they have it, and then campus is calling that engagement, right? So yes. student to instructor, student to student engagement. So this is how this course is going to engage and communicate with you um, this semester is where I would right. put those two sections. Um, this is how we're going to communicate. This is our weekly pacing. This is what's asynchronous. This is what's synchronous. These are my expectations. Yeah. within the course syllabus to talk about how to engage, how to ask questions, and how to receive help. I'm glad you um, brought up that uh, the idea of pacing because sort of the course rhythm is one of the things that, that I didn't remember to add into what do we talk about when we, or what do we add to a syllabus. Giving the students some sense of this is what a course will feel like. This will be the rhythm of a course, the pace of a course. On Mondays we're going to do this, on Tuesdays we're going to do this, Wednesdays I expect you to think about this, Thursdays da 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 da. Um, Having the students say, all right, I've got a picture in my mind of what the rhythm of the course or the pacing of the course is going to look like um, is also a, a really good thing to have in there. Good. Um, thank you for somebody who put together uh, the um, link for the plain language and formatting. Um, and then our last question is, what needs to be the syllabus to help students learn and uh, learn to navigate and use Canvas and weekly pacing? Oh, we just talked about that. Uh, and what structure is most helpful to keep expectations clear, especially during remote learning? All right. If you want to keep expectations clear, don't just put it in the syllabus. Repeat it over and over and over again. Um, the same as you would repeat the learning outcomes and tie every day to, we're doing this today, because it connects in this way to the outcome, which will help you on your path. Um, if you make those connections for students or have the students think about and make the connections themselves, that's, that's golden. Um, same thing with the expectations, right? Um, tell them over again, um, not just once in one document that at the beginning of the semester when they were overwhelmed with all this information coming in, um, you expect them to remember that or to keep that at the top of their mind. It's too much to ask of a human, in my opinion. Um, so re re remind them, especially in remote learning where you can't see their faces as much um, and their, their uh, nonverbal feedback. Other thoughts on that? Any other questions that um, weren't in the, uh, the chart here? that um, that you'd like to talk to or, or, or talk about um, in the last two minutes here or one minute that we have a chance to raise your hand and unmute your mic and jump in all right then um, thank you all for uh, coming today and um, jumping in as you as you did I just put a link in the um, in the chat here to our proposed sessions for next semester. Um, and as part of the Active Teaching Lab sort of regular thing, um, this is participant driven, right? So if you have ideas, uh, resources, um,
people that I should talk to or resources that we should use to build these um, out for next semester, please jump in and share them with us. Um, that would be lovely if you could do that in that document. Um, if you're from STATS and you're, you need a, a, an email confirmation that you were here today, um, please send me an email at uh, johnmartin at wisc.edu to remind me because I won't remember it um, unless you do that. So thank you all, and I hope to see you all this next semester, and I hope that the rest of your semester goes fantastic. Thanks for joining us this semester. Appreciate it. And I'll stick around for the next um, few minutes, and then we'll have a break, and then I will meet with my Delta class. So if anyone would like to talk um, 